Good evening, everybody. I'm Peter Magnani from the Walnut Creek Library Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Live from the Library presentation uh, uh, where Michael Barrington is going to be talking to us about the French resistance during World War II. Uh, a couple of announcements. First, I want to thank tonight's sponsors, the East Bay Times, Minuteman Press, and the Friends of the Walnut Creek Library. And uh, if you like these programs, you enjoy these programs, and you want to help us pay for them, I would invite you to become a sponsor, too. You can go to our website, www.wclibrary.org, and hit the Donate button, or even better, you can just put a couple of spare bills in the tip jar at the refreshment table in the back of the room. Those tips don't go to our hardworking volunteers. They go to funding <laughs> programs like these. Um, and then uh, don't worry, if, if you hear a public address announcement out in the hall of saying the library is about to close, the building was designed so that we can use this room whether the library is open or not, so everybody's going to be able to get out just fine. Um, so on to tonight's program. Um, Michael Barrington is the author of two historical novels that are set in the uh, milieu of the uh, French Resistance. Let the Peacock Sing from 2020 and uh, No Time for Heroes, which was published last year. Uh, and he's going to be selling copies of those books in the lobby after the program tonight. Uh, and if you uh, sing him a few bars from La Marseillaise, he might uh, autograph them for you. Um, so Michael has published uh, more than 30 stories, uh, six novels, and he's working on his seventh. Uh, but I have to say that doesn't even begin to describe uh, the, uh, the man we're going to be hearing from tonight. Um, so I'm going to give you a few highlights and I'm going to read this because I don't want to leave anything out. And um, I know this is all true because I read it on the internet. <laughs> so uh, th th this is a life that's filled with the kind of courage and adventure and romance that we can sometimes associate with the French resistance itself. So here's some highlights. For the last five years, he's been providing water and plumbing to schools in Honduras. Before that, he drilled wells and built schools in Burkina Faso. He founded an orphanage for teenage girls in Ethiopia and built bridges in the Andes. He lived as a hermit for a year in Northern Ireland, taught school in Spain and Puerto Rico, and directed an international student program in Latin America. Um, and I, I've got one more if you're up for it. Uh, he, uh, during a civil war in West Africa, he was uh, put up in front of a firing squad. But happily, he's here with us tonight. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Michael Barrington. Thank you so much. And... Uh, I too am worried about fake news, <clears throat> but thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming. Um, my two historical novels, uh, like The Peacock Sing and No Room for Heroes, um, are set in France from 1941 to 1944. Uh, although they both have the French resistance as background, they're quite different not just in the stories they tell, but in their geography. Sorry, my... One is centered in Western France, the other in the East. I would describe the peacock uh, as more a liter in literary style, um, as it follows the, the, the char different characters uh, against the backdrop of the resistance. No Room for Heroes reads more like a history uh, the, of the period, but is illustrated by the lives and characters who were there. I'd like to start my talk uh, with two statements. Firstly, I use many photos uh, that were taken uh, during World War II. And at that time, they didn't have smartphones, so the quality is, pretty, is lacking on many of them. And secondly, I will flip between talking about the resistance and the, the maquis. And the maquis is what the French resistance called themselves. It's a French word, obviously, and it means really uh, people who live uh, in, the, in, the, in the woods, in the hills, 
if you would, in the shadows. So you'll keep hearing me saying, talking about the Maquis. Um, the armistice between Germany and France was unique in many ways. Of all the countries that Germany occupied, France was the only one that collaborated with the Germans. Both the French and the Germans thought the occupation would be temporary and last only until Britain came to terms which was believed to be imminent. For instance, the French agreed that the, its soldiers would remain prisoners of war, 1.8 million of them, until the cessation of all hostilities. The Germans didn't know what to do with so many prisoners. So most were sent to work in factories in Germany. Initially, it was impossible to feed them. Think about it. This was an invading army. They were a fighting force. They had no idea what to do with prisoners, so many of them. So they decided uh, to put them, most of them in a group, uh, 300,000 of them, in a camp outside Paris. And they said any man who had four or more children would be demobilized and sent home. And one of those was my father-in-law, who went back home to Vierzon and promptly joined the resistance. As a result of the armistice, the country was divided. And most people think it was divided in two, between the occupied zone in the north, it covered the north and the west coast, and the free zone. But if you notice, on the east side, you have the green and the yellow, and that chunk of land was given from the, French, from the Swiss border down to the, uh, the Mediterranean to the Italians. And so the Italians were there until 1943. A, a pseudo-French state was created under the German umbrella, and though nominally extending its sovereignty over the whole country, it was in practice limited in ex exercising its authority to, to the free zone. Paris was located in the occupied zone, and so they had to have a new capital, and they put it in Vichy. Immediately after the armistice, Churchill realized that the Allies had lost a critical source of intelligence and formed the Strategic Operational Executive. It's quite a mouthful, but it's referred to simply as SOE. It became known, and that was to provide uh, radio operators and saboteurs who, as he said, would set Europe ablaze. Meanwhile, this man arrived in London, a guy called de Gaulle. Nobody knew who he was, except that he'd been a tank commander somewhere. But he set himself up in the French Quarter in London and managed to talk the BBC into giving him time. And three days after the armistice, he spoke to the French people over the BBC and said, we must never let the Nazis take over France. We must resist. One of the very first to respond was a group in Paris at the, the Museum of Man. And they started producing a, a, a guy called Maurice Vilde, uh, who was uh, um, a linguist. And they started producing um, underground newspapers. And they did it all the way through 1940 uh, until December. And they were betrayed by one of their own members. The Germans were very kind of nervous about this group, and so they kept them in prison for a year. And then 19 members were accused, including women. They were sent to Ravensbrück, but 10 of the men were executed. When we talk of the resistance, uh, it may sound like that the, it was a homogenous group. It was far from being a homogenous group. If you, you notice at the top there, I've put five. In the occupied uh, area, there were five major groups of resistance. In the free zone, there were at least three. And when I'm talking of these eight, there are simply eight who you would identify almost as political parties. It's the only way to think about them. <clears throat> 
I do I put up this little diagram just to show you some sort of organization. Um, if you think of how our democratic or republican systems work, we have an office at the state, we have an office in the county, and then we may have offices in various cities. That's what that refers to in terms of resistance. Except that they were, not linked, they were only linked together by the political party. In terms of operating and doing, if you would, subversive work, it was a free for all. They did what they wanted. What London wanted was to provide a radio operator who could get intelligence back to London. They wanted to know about troop movements. They wanted to identify potential bombing sites, gasoline and weapons, and gas was a major, that's a whole different presentation talking about gas during World War II. It was a major, major problem. They wanted to know about the factories that the Germans were converting into producing arms. They wanted to know about the principal train depots, the times of trains, what kinds of trains, were they freight, were they carrying troops? They wanted all this information. Churchill was flying blind. That was the problem. As the groups developed the resistance, they started escorting downed Allied airmen to the, Swiss bo to the um, Spanish border. And of course, when the, Jews, uh, the Jewish question came up, they started taking Jews into Switzerland and across the, the Spanish border. But locally, what did these people do? Uh, they tried to disrupt the Germans so they wouldn't get settled. Uh, they started producing underground newspapers. There were no, all radios were forbidden. So they started to produce the real news. They wanted to present, prevent the Germans from getting supplies. And they developed the famous hit and run tactics. Hit the Germans, get your stuff, and get back out of it. And so they attacked convoys of trucks that were carrying supplies and stole them, of course. And they did the same with many of the trains. But who were these people? Who were these Maki? In the cities and towns, they were your everyday folk, postal workers, laborers, bank clerks, teachers, hotel workers, business owners, policemen. In the rural areas, it was slightly different. You had those who worked and lived in and around the village, and those who lived as full-time resistance, but hidden in the forests and the hills. Um, some of the groups included um, soldiers who'd fled, rather than being, taken, ca being captured by the Germans. They fled home, they literally escaped, and they went into the Maquis too. This is an actual photograph. These are actual photographs of the groups around Brive la Gaillard. You will notice how a couple of the guys are wearing helmets from World War I. And some of the guys are holding shotguns. They were going to make a big difference on the Germans. But this is how they started. They were a ragtag group. There were also, did you notice, women? And the women, particularly, were used as carriers uh, in the villages uh, because there were checkpoints. And it was mainly the French police who were turning in the resistance, not the Germans. It was the French turning in their own. So, but the women, uh, they seemed to get through the checkpoints easier than the men. So they went around on their bicycles, carrying their messages from group to group. And there were by the thousand, these women. Uh, in January 1943, the, the Germans, in collaboration with Vichy, issued what was called the STO, the Service du Travail Obligatoire, Obligatory Work Service. So they wanted all these young men aged between uh, 20 and 23 to go and work in Germany. And uh, they rounded them up. It was obligatory. Uh, it's estimated that 60,000 of them ran away and joined the resistance groups. But that created problems for the residents because they had no way of screening all these young men who suddenly arrived. And of course, the Gestapo used them to infiltrate many of the groups, which they did. And on top of this, the Gestapo helped France create, the Vichy group create, what was called the Milice. And these were really, really bad people. 
and they were a paramilitary organization. They were recruited from towns and villages where they spoke the local patois language. They knew the countryside, they knew everybody in the towns. They were initially unarmed, but they infiltrated, infil infiltrated many of the groups. Their sole job was to hunt down resistance and Jews. They were not paid. They were told that if they got a Jewish house, they could take whatever they wanted. They were feared more than the Gestapo and the SS because they had absolutely no code of conduct. At the end of the war, before anybody else was troubled, they got their comeuppance in spades because the resistance turned on them and there were kangaroo courts set up all over France. That I've never got the real numbers on this, but it looks like 150,000 of them were summarily taken care of. Nineteen forty three uh, was a really sad year. It was a big year in some ways for the resistance because they started to really grow, but they learned very quickly that killing Germans does not work. They tried it and there were horrible, horrible reprisals. One of the biggest was uh, infiltration was in and around Paris, where the Prosper network was betrayed. And the Prosper network involved hundreds of resistance. It also included several agents, SOE agents, and altogether over 200 Maquis were killed or sent to the camps because of an infiltrator. But what was worse, the Germans captured their radios and their code books. And for months, they were communicating with London as if nothing had happened. And they got all kinds of information and it led to other betrayals. 1943 was not a good, a good year. But something did happen that was excellent, and it's all to do with this man, Jean Moulin. He um, was the equivalent of a um, head of state, a head of a state in the Loire, and uh, he refused to cooperate with the Germans, and for that he was tortured. He was taken to prison and he was tortured. But he was afraid he would give information away about the resistance. So he tried to commit suicide by slashing his throat with a piece of glass. And it didn't work. He ended up in hospital. But from hospital, they, he was able to escape. For the rest of his life, he wore a scarf around his neck. But de Gaulle invited him to London and begged him to try and unify these eight huge resistance groups that were all politically different. And he did it. He managed to have this huge meeting. He got them together and they created two groups, which was uh, the unity of the French resistance groups and also the secret army, as they called it, which became the military arm of the resistance. Unfortunately, um, he was betrayed himself with eight of his friends and uh, captured by the Gestapo one month after their first meeting. And he died after being horribly tortured by Klaus Barbie, he may have heard the name, the Butcher of Lyon. And uh, he was beaten to pulp, put on a train, and they were taking him to Auschwitz, but he died at Metz, in Metz on the train. That was the National Council of Resistance, which he developed, and the secret army. So Churchill started founding the SOE, and he asked a woman, a very normal woman, if you would, she was only a secretary at the time uh, in intelligence, to form SOE together with a guy called Maurice Bookmaster. And uh, they selected all kinds of people, but they were particularly interested in what was called the French section, so everybody had to speak French. And uh, they were sent for training in Scotland for 10 weeks, and it was brutal, because at the same time where, where they were training, the British had just started training the equivalent of our Navy SEALs. They were called commandos. So you've got these, if you would, you know, country bumpkins going up there and being trained alongside uh, these very heavy duty folks. So uh, one of the guys is called Sid, and he is, speaks French, and he is a boffin, he's a mathematician. So here he is with this crowd, 
and he's been going through all of the stuff. And this is from No Room for Heroes. You're not even trying, the instructor shouted at Sid. You're supposed to be attempting to bloody kill me. Use the knife, man. Come on, you bastard. Run at me. Stick it in me. Don't hold it like a A split second later, after trying again, Sid found himself pinned down with the instructor's arm locked across his chest and the knife at his throat. You let me take the bloody knife from you again, you ass he claimed. You're fucking useless. You must have a death wish. Any greenhorn German would eat you for breakfast. I could give up on you, you wimp, but I'm not about to have anybody fail my class. The rest of you can go, he bawled at the shock group. He stays until he learns how to kill me, even with his bare hands. So Sid gets through that part, and they thin out the group. There's only seven left of his group, and they go down to Manchester so they can start training a parachute drop, parachute training. So the RAF instructor who conducted the classes treated this group with complete disdain. They were not attached to any particular military unit. In his estimation, it was an utter disgrace to wear the king's uniform without any identifying patches and let them know he considered them to be just playing soldiers. He introduced them to the actual parachute itself and took them through a Nissen hut where lines of women's auxiliary air force were packing them into the containers. Sid, ever the mathematician, asked the instructor, what was the average speed of the falling human body when loaded with equipment? And similar questions. It provoked a stony silence and a piercing stare. The instructor, already seeming to take a personal dislike to Sid, singled him out and said with a sneer, take a good look at how hard these ladies are working, Chapman. It demands a great deal of skill. And oh, by the way, if when your parachute it proves to be defective and fails to open at 3,000 feet, then bring it back here and they'll replace it. <laughs> they were trained like James Bond. Uh, they had to, in fact, uh, on the right hand, left hand side there, you see that the radio from 1941, uh, that weighed almost 40 pounds alone. And they were going to drop with that. They had uh, the one on the right hand side is from 1944, and they got it down to 22 pounds. But they had a single shot uh, fountain pen, another fountain pen that was like a stiletto. They had used silencers, and of course, the flick knife. And the flick knife was not uh, a knife that had spring loaded blade, it was flicked by the wrist, and the blade shot out. And they all had to use it, it was lethal. Most of the uh, resistance. The agents were taken in on this little plane called the Westland Lysander. It was a very, very slow plane, uh, but they put an extra fuel tank underneath it, as you can see there, and they also welded a little ladder. Can you see the ladder on, on the, behind the second cockpit? That is not stock. The SOE welded that on so they could squeeze at least three agents into the rear, the rear cockpit, and that enabled them to get out quickly but it could land and take off on a soccer field. It was an amazing plane. But um, as you can see up from the map, on the, the distance to Brive la Gaillard is one, but on the other side of the country where the green is, you needed a bigger plane with greater distance, and they used the Halifax bomber, stripped of all its armaments, and they used that for dropping agents and for supplies. And when Sid goes uh, to uh, Grenoble, he flies, from that, he flies from that plane. He's dropped from that plane. There, there was always a squabble, even though the groups had agreed to work together. The Maquis still fought for, for, for supplies. And so when they were dropped, uh, they argued like heck. They tried to arrive before they should, so they could compete and get the canisters when they fell. Uh, and this went on and on and on. They continued fighting for supplies. What was worse was that um, in 1944, in preparation for D-Day, um, the Brits sent over hundreds of thousands of uh, French francs. 
so that the Maquis could really equip themselves and buy food and all kinds of stuff. And unfortunately, loads of this stuff dropped right on top of German camps. It was totally messed up. And, and so it was a, a spring of 1944. They de developed what was called the s phone, And the s phone was worn on the chest, as you can see, and they could contact a pilot once he was within 30 miles of the drop zone, and they would talk the pilot in. Uh, we talked glibly about SOE and the agents going over there and working uh, for, for Churchill, but the, these are the hard numbers. 420 went through SOE, these were males, 117 were killed. There were 41 women and 25 were killed, and the average length of operation was six weeks. As the Brits became better at training the, the agents, the Germans became better at finding them, and particularly uh, w those who were in cities or towns, because the Germans could move around. The book has never been written yet about the French railways. Uh, I keep saying to Annie that I will do it, um, but I don't think so. It's still a hot topic everywhere. Um, why? Well, first of all, the Germans could never have taken France without the railways. Think about it. Tanks don't run on roads. Heavy, heavy guns don't move on roads. You've got to move them on railways. And they were very fortunate because the, ra the, the railway gauge of Poland, Be Belgium, Holland, uh, right into France was, was the same as Germany. Uh, and also what worked for the Germans is that the Cheminots, those are the French railway workers, they were communist. And in 1940, they were taking their instructions directly from Russia, from Stalin. Think about this. So in 1940, at the armistice, they're not going to fight the Germans because the Germans are working with the Russians. So for the first year of the war, the Germans had a free run on the railways in France. Then, he, then in June 1941, what does Hitler do? He attacks Russia. So now the railway workers say, oh, now we can go for it. So that's exactly what they did. And they joined, they, joined, they formed their own Mackey groups, which, be, which became a force to be reckoned with because there were hundreds of thousands of these workers. Uh, Brive la Gaillarde, which before the war was just a tiny town, uh, it had a railway junction. But once the Germans came in, it developed into a major, a major um, uh, junction altogether. It provided all the trains for Bordeaux right down to the Spanish border had to go through Brive. And the Germans uh, were so uh, hard put because of all the trouble called by the Maquis, they were wrecking the locomotives, they were tearing up the tracks, they were exploding bridges, anything to annoy the Germans and prevent them from moving around. They brought in their own engineers from Germany. But this is where they were caught. According to the armistice, their, their locomotive engineers could not drive locomotives in France. So they doubled him up with a French engineer and a German engineer so he could watch that the engineer, the French engineer, didn't wreck the locomotive crazy. And the same for repairing the tracks, because they kept blowing up the tracks, so they brought in workers from Germany to watch the French, so they, were, so they repaired the, the tracks in the correct way. Uh, the chief of uh, railways in uh, Brive was a guy called um, uh, Gane, Raymond Gane, and uh, he did his best. He would wait for a train to come in from Germany with supplies it would contain, for example, German uniforms, underwear, boots, caps, all that, and by the thousand, of course, to service all the troops, and sometimes canned goods from Germany. And he would shunt it onto a siding that no one would ever see and left it there for weeks. Then they would take off, the Mackie would take out of it what they wanted, he would relabel the, the train and send it back on a six-week trip to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> 
Meanwhile, all over the area, the Maki were hard at it, disrupting things. In, in um, the other side of France, um, where Sid was, uh, the, he organized taking a train that was coming up from the south of France to Grenoble for the Germans. And they knew it was loaded with food and supplies. So he organized the, with the cheminot, with the workers, he organized, so when it got 30 miles outside of Grenoble, they sent it onto a disused track that hadn't been used for years. So they diverted the train on these tracks and it went for 20 miles right to where the Maki were waiting. And they worked through the night and stripped it and then fed everybody in the area. So the importance of the railways was really, really important. And here you can see when the Germans were being pushed out of France, what are they doing? They're ripping up the tracks so the Allies couldn't use them. With all of this background, all of this background is in both of my books. Um, it's now November 1942, and the map of France has changed. These are the three maps of France. If you look at them carefully at the top, you've got the map from 1940. And then in 1942, what happened? The, the Germans took over the free zone. And the Italians are still there. And then in 1943, September, what did they do? They kick out the Italians. So you've got three kinds of maps. In No Room for Heroes, my book is divided into three, three books, Italian Occupation, German Occupation, and the Battle of the Vercor. The story of No Room for Heroes follows the lives of two female, two identical twins, 28-year-old identical twil, twins, Monique and Marie-Claude. Uh, they're from a village high up on the plateau um, where their father also, Edouard, is in the Maquis. Uh, Monique is a professor at the University of Grenoble, and Marie-Claude is a nurse on the plateau. This other guy in the middle is Abbé Pierre, and some of you may know the history of Abbé Pierre. This is the real guy who became such a figure in France for the next 40 years. But at this time, he was in the resistance and he was in charge of the cathedral in Grenoble. And there it is. The other building is City Hall. That's Sid, who is dropped in as the SOE agent, and the other one is a priest from the plateau, a guy called Laurence. Lawrence. There's the university, and two groups, Maki groups, ran out of there, one of them headed by Monique. And that's the plateau. It's a limestone plateau that suddenly towers up. For those of you who have been to Grenoble, you've seen this. It suddenly appears out of nowhere. So the book number one focuses on um, the Italian occupation. But the way I've written my book... I jump from the first, the first chapter jumps forward and it talks about when the Germans are there. So, and then it flips back. For the rest of the book, it's sequential. But the first chapter, in that sense, and it's simply the way I wrote the book, uh, it, it's kind of intriguing. So here we go. M Monique has been caught in Grenoble. There was a march to a monument for World War I, the dead of World War I, and she got caught up in it. And as a result, she was brought in by the Gestapo, she's been interrogated, and now she's ended up in front of the new, in quotes, mayor of Grenoble, a guy called Schalke, a German lieutenant. Take off your clothes. She was surprised by the softness of his voice. She didn't know what it would sound like. She'd never given it much thought, but it was quite unexpected. His steely gray eyes never wavered or left her face. It was as if he could see straight through her. He wasn't smiling. Take off your clothes, he repeated. His name was just a name. He was new to Grenoble, but he was already establishing a reputation for himself. Monique was unsure what she should do, even though she'd heard him quite clearly. Clearly. 
his cold, unflinching eyes starkly contrasting to the apparent relaxed position of the rest of his body seemed to cut right through her. As he leaned back into a comfortable, well-worn leather chair, his highly polished jack-booted cross legs resting on a corner of the desk, his cap casually placed on top of a tray filled with assorted papers, and the top button of his military tunic undone. He was not what she was expecting. It made her momentarily question all she'd seen and heard about the meticulous way all German officers dressed. She had heard his words and his repeated request, but felt paralyzed. She'd only, known, she'd only ever shown her naked body to one man and never to a stranger. She was both terrified and embarrassed at the thought. But more importantly, she desperately needed to ease herself. She'd been there all day, taking a chance and hoping he would respond positively. She blurted out, Sir, I urgently need a bathroom. As he lounged in his chair with an open file across his knees, his fingers clasped and intertwined across his stomach, Schalke's eyes never deviated from her face. With only the slightest motion of his left hand, a finger pointed towards the interior door. As graciously but as quickly as she could, she took large strides, opened the door, and finally relieved herself. It gave her just a few moments to decide how to respond to his command. There were, she realized, no options. Returning to where she had previously stood, she first removed her top coat, carefully folding it, then placing it on the nearest chair. Her dress followed, and she stood rigid in her underwear, hoping he would not want more. Still in his sphinx-like position, Schalke indicated with a slight move of his finger that she should continue disrobing. But sir, I have my period, she exclaimed, ashamed she had to admit it and embarrassed about how she would show herself to him. She felt humiliated, knowing he was watching her every movement as she struggled to remove and conceal her undergarments beneath her folded coat. There was no shock or sympathy in his steely frigid eyes. Another slight finger movement, and she knew there was no other option but to stand there naked. She just appreciated the fact that unlike most other public buildings, this one was centrally heated. Instinctively, while shielding her private parts with her hands, he indicated she placed them by her sides. Embarrassingly, she could feel the warm blood beginning to ooze between her thighs. It seemed like an eternity, while he scrutinized every inch of her body, his face registering no emotion or feelings. Another finger movement, and she turned so he could see her back. It was so much easier not to look at him, and easier to hide her shame. She had so many questions. Why was he making her do this? Was he about to rape her? She'd heard horror stories about some Germans. Was he just showing how much power he had? Or was it just some fetish? You can turn round now. The sound of his voice startled her. He spoke French with a heavy German accent. It's the beginning of chapter one of this book. Like I said, it... It's as if it's German, but chapter two flips right back to the Italian occupation. And the Italians were a different animal altogether. Uh, although, theoretically, they came under the rule of Vichy, the Italians were a rule unto themselves. Thank you for that. And so when the issues came out about the Jews being uh, hunted down in Vichy, the Italians refused. Uh, when the Maquis were being chased by the Germans, the Italians turned a blind eye. And so thousands and thousands of Maquis and Jews ended up in and around Grenoble. In 1943, the Italians were kicked out of France because Mussolini had been taken out and the Italians had joined the Allies. And so the twins are working away. Marie Claude is on the plateau, acting as a nurse. Both these girls were expert skiers, and so they're taking people across the border into Switzerland and sheltering uh, downed airmen and Jews. Marie Claude was keeping them in the hospital, and Monique was running them across the border from Grenoble. Uh, 
a complication starts to happen. And one of those unforeseen things is that Monique starts to fall for Sid, the SOE agent. And Marie Claude starts to have an affair with the local priest up on the plateau. <laughs> and uh, it's well underway. <laughs> and uh, Lawrence. Lawrence comes home late one night into the parish house. And uh, he's about to open his bedroom door when a light appeared at the end of the hallway. Standing there holding a candle was his pastor, Abbe Blanchet. Lawrence, he called softly, would you come and talk with me, please? I just want you to listen to me, Lawrence, so please let me speak. I've been a priest for almost 50 years. I'm not saying all those years have been exemplary or that I always said I did the right thing. I only know just how weak or strong I've been, but I'm still a priest regardless. I have also known hundreds in the ministry and have learned to recognize when a brother needs help. I've known for months you come home late at night and sometimes in the small hours of the morning, like tonight. I said nothing. I know you've been visiting the, visiting the hospital. I know, you, I know you've not been visiting families, so it can only be the hospital where you do excellent work for the sick and suffering. And so as your pastor, I need to ask myself, what keeps you there? What could you possibly be doing so late at night? He paused to cough briefly, holding his hand over his mouth. Lawrence just sat there wondering what was coming next. I could, of course, surmise you were talking with one of the nurses, since they are the only people on duty. My mind might play tricks with me, and I might imagine you were attracted to one of them. My imagination might run riot and tell me you're falling in love with one of them. But my experience tells me it's beyond those things, and might be something else, that it's becoming something which is now controlling you. You're a fine priest, Lawrence, but if anything I've said resonates within you, then you have a major decision to make, and soon. The kind of attraction and love I'm talking about could make or break you. Good night, my son. I'll pray for you. Dressed as a, dressed as a nun, Monique, against her will, is told, she's told to dress up like an, a nun by, by the Mackey group because they had three people downed airmen who'd been very badly burned. And so her sister took care of them on the plateau and nursed them. And so what they did, they covered their heads completely in bandages so you could just see their eyes and a bit of their nose. And then they dressed Monique up as a nun and asked her to take these three down to Marseille and then get them across the border into Spain. Sid, at the same time, shows his skills through serious acts of sh sabotage, uh, destruction of railways and, web and uh, deep depots and so on and so forth. But the novel reaches its climax in book three, uh, which describes the largest direct confrontation during the war between resistance groups and the German army, the Battle of the Vercors. 4,000 Maquis by this time, 4,000 are on the plateau. And they're breaking away from the tactics they do best of hit and run. They are asked by de Gaulle to dig in and make a stand against the Germans, who it is anticipated will be pushed north from the Marseille, pushed north because of the Allies landing. The Allies by this time were in North Africa. They're going to come over and go through the south of France and push the Germans north. And so they were to dig, dig in and wait for the Germans to arrive and take care of them. Um, de Gaulle, unfortunately, was unfaithful to them. He rescinded the order, but didn't tell everybody. And on top of that, uh, the general who was in charge of coming across from North Africa, from Algiers, he gave the instructions for them to dig in and hold for the Germans. He said he would send a division of paratroopers. They never arrived. 
They were waiting on a shipment of heavy, heavy weaponry. That didn't arrive. And Sid is frantic on the radio, radioing to London, radioing to Algiers, begging them for two things. They needed heavy weapons if they were going to uh, hold, uh, hold back the Germans. And secondly, there was an airfield to the south of Grenoble that they knew the Germans were using, and they wanted it bombed. None of Sid's messages were returned. And the airfield, unfortunately, was never bombed. So the Germans, to get on the plateau, they towed 20 gliders full of men onto the plateau. And these were your top-notch troops. So given everything else, it was short-lived. The battle was going to be over very quickly. And it was. It was all over in five days. Edwards is wounded. Marie-Claude and Lawrence, um, they were nurses. With all the doctors, they were collected and rounded up by the Gestapo and taken away. Book three, uh, book three ends, if you would, on that sad note in some ways. Um, uh, if you would, where the Marquis were defeated, ultimately. But I end the book where I began it with the twins. And... Uh, I've also written what was called an aftermath. So when you get to that in the, book, you, in the book, you might say, oh my God, is that it? And so I wrote an aftermath, and I tell you what happened, both to the Germans, many of whom actually got convicted for atrocities, and what happened to all the main players. So I'm not going to be a spoiler and tell you how it all ended, but by my book. Um, let the Peacock Sing is a different book altogether, and it takes place, as you can see, on the other side of the country, in that tiny little place where the star is of Brive la Gaillard. Um, there are six main characters. You've got Henriette on the left there, a very sophisticated, fashion-conscious, but very religious countess, a widower and owner of a chateau winery. She's also the head of a bunch of resistance groups. And having donated land on which a monastery was built, she later admits her unrequited love for the abbot, Père Louis. He's originally from Alsace and speaks fluent German. Before becoming a monk, he was a medical doctor, and he leads a double life as a monk and as a Mackie. The book begins uh, as the occupational map of France, as I showed you, starts to change. And uh, the book starts with Henriette. Well, where, where else would you want to find her? Is in the chapel of the monastery. So, signaling to Brother Roger to come over as he extinguished the candles and began putting the materials away, she whispered to him, that she would like to meet with her confessor, Père Yves. Without a moment's hesitation, the brother slipped silently away while Henriette removed herself to the side chapel that held the box where confessions took place and waited. A buzzer near the door gently sounded, signaling that the priest was present. She entered the dark closet with soft light coming from a solitary light bulb above her head. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. There was a long pause. Yes, Henriette, do you have something to tell me? The priest said quietly in a tone that invited confidence. There was another long pause. Yes, Père, she said slowly. Then taking a folded sheet of notepaper from her pocket, slid it under the small window light covered screen separating her from the priest. There was another even longer pregnant silence. A deep, mature but knowing, gentle voice said, Henriette, are you certain about this? Yes, Père, I received the information in the night. Are all these details correct? Yes, Père. I'm sure I, completed, I completely trust the source. Please give the information to the abbot, Père Louis. He needs to know that the Germans have been amassing troops, trucks, and tanks for days, and tomorrow they will invade the free zone. It is essential that he attend an assembly tonight at the chateau at five o'clock. I've called an emergency meeting of all the area maquis and all the leaders from Brive la Gaillard. It was Monday, 
November the 11th, 1942. A beautiful young woman is in the middle. And she is an SOE agent called Simone, alias Sparrow. And when she is dropped by parachute, uh, she gets caught up in a tree and is pretty beaten up. And so who's going to take care of her but the doctor, Père Louis. And she tries to flirt with him. It doesn't work. Um, but she, she's, she's becoming attracted to him. These are the other players. That is Clotilde on the left, and she manages the chateau for Henriette. And uh, don't go near her. She's a piece of work. <laughs> she is very protective. And of course, you've got the um, Raymond, who's the railway chief, and Jules, who is the chief of police, and they were all part of um, the pickup group. This is City Hall. It's like it is today. It hasn't changed since 1943. This is the City Hall in brive la gaillard You can still go visit it. And in 1943, uh, when the, the Germans sent down there four, um, four women, the Beide Meidel, they were called, and um, these were women who timed out from the uh, uh, Hitler Youth at 22, and they joined the army. And they were sent down there uh, for administrative purposes, so they ran City Hall. And anybody who had anything to sell, you had to get permission from City Hall. And of course, the chateau was sending f produce down there every day to be sold. And one of them uh, it was sold by one of the youngest men in the in the peacock group, Lucien. His father was the winemaker. So he went there every day, and what does he do? He falls in love with one of these women. It does not end well, because she gets pregnant. And uh, uh, she is sent back to Germany. He is tortured, and uh, pretty badly. Uh, but on top of that, when he comes back to the chateau, Henriette kicks him out of the peacock group for betraying the trust. But it's only on the uh, advice of Père Louis later that she brings him back in. But um, Henriette, as you can see, she is quite a lady. And um, she has to take a trip to Paris, waiting on the platform for the 8.30 express train from Brive to Paris, wearing a beautiful navy blue ankle length coat by Schiaparelli with white fox fur collar and cuffs and a fedora styled hat complete with matching feather. Henriette stood out with both men and women staring at her. It was a rare occurrence, a very rare occurrence, to see such an elegantly dressed lady in public, and especially so in these times of material hardship and rationing. As the train pulled out of Brive, she removed her gloves and opening her purse took out a small book to read. At that very moment, the train suddenly jerked forward and the book fell to the floor. Sitting opposite in the middle seat, an officer quickly stood up and reached down for it, and with a glance at the title, handed it back to her. Thank you, officer, she said. I'm grateful. Madam, may I present myself? I'm Lieutenant Colonel Karl Bommelberg, he announced with a bow and click of his heels before retaking his seat. His name began to resonate the back of, at the back of her mind, but she couldn't clearly recall what the association was. I see that you're reading Nuptials by Albert Camus, she said. I assume it's an interesting book. I read his other volume of essays last year, Betwixt and Between, and found them most interesting. Yes, she finally responded, I found Camus uh, fascinating. It's a collection of four essays dealing with absurdity and suicide. He examines religious hopes and re rejects, relig reje rejects religions and life after death. Instead, he advocates for living now. In these troubled times where we're surrounded by so much death and destruction, it's a fitting read. Indeed, madam, and may I say it's a rare pleasure to meet such an educated and sophisticated lady. Henriette chose to ignore the flattery and instead wondered if there would be any advantage to her or her group in knowing more about this man. And you, sir, can I ask why you as a German read modern French literature? That, almost, that also must be a rarity. Leaning forward, his body language was clear. He wanted to engage with her. 
where I studied French as a student and spent five wonderful years in France, including three at the Sorbonne. I like everything French, music, poetry, art, and especially your wonderful food, he added with a chuckle. But of course, I also love my own culture. And in fact, in Paris, I'll be attending the opera tomorrow night to see the magic flute, music from one of the great German composers for the fatherland. Without showing any inviting facial expression, but looking him directly in the eye, she replied with a touch of sarcasm. I'm familiar with the fact that Mozart wrote his opera in German, but I didn't know that it was considered to be Nazi music. Wasn't he born in Austria, in Salzburg perhaps? And then quickly continued, is that the only reason you'll be in Paris? She, she talks further with uh, this man, Bommelberg, and eventually he gives her his business card, calling card as it was, which she uses later, later on when the chateau is um, threatened by the Gestapo. But that's another story. So, Karl Bommelberg, that she met on the train, is not a nice guy. He was the head of the Gestapo in Paris, and he turned out his office and he was being sent to Vichy to straighten out all the nonsense that was going on in the free zone. And as you can see, he was responsible for deporting 76,000 Jews and 28,000 of the Maki. At the end of the war, it's really interesting, at the end of the war, um, he was being almost caught by the Americans who were onto him. And what he did, he stole the dog tags of a dead German soldier. And he was passing himself off as a, a private. But unfortunately for him, he was in the wrong place. And he slipped on ice and broke his neck. A suitable end. Père Louis, because he spoke fluent German, uh, would dress up in a lieutenant colonel's uniform, and it's a veterinary uniform, as, dressed as a veterinarian. And so he could travel all over France or wherever he wanted without people asking any questions. And what he was doing, he was taking uh, Jewish, uh, taking airmen and Jews down to the Spanish border. Um, that is one, one instance that took place um, as they settled into their seats, watched jealousy by the soldiers crammed into the corridor, Père Louis carefully placed his gloves, briefcase and cap on the seat next to himself and sat back. One of the Jewish men was seated directly opposite him and as the train began to pull out of the station, he shouted at him for the benefit of the officers staring into the compartment. Move your ass, I need that space. And as the man quickly moved to the opposite side, Père Louis stretched out and crossing his legs, rested his boots on the vacated seat. The journey continued almost without incident. An SS soldier performing a ticket check and travel past control took one look at the lieutenant and with a quick salute moved on. Suddenly one of the men stood up and facing the window started to rock back and forth and began murmuring some prayers in Yiddish. Hoping that none of the Germans in the corridor had noticed, Père Louis, who just started to doze, quickly sprang to his feet and in one lightning fast movement grabbed him by the shoulder with one hand, spun him round and with the other hammered his fist into the man's face. He dropped to the floor like a rock. Do you want to get us killed? He hissed through his teeth. We should have left you behind. The other men looked terrified and bent down to help him but there was blood pouring from his nose and a cut at the corner of his mouth. He was starting to moan and whimpered, it's the Sabbath, it's the Sabbath. No leaving there, Pelloui whispered, we're being watched. And he turned, stretched to his full six feet height and gave the officers in the corridor an icy stare. So Pelloui was not a person to be messed with either. Towards the end of the book, there's a lot of stuff going on with the Maquis in various places, but they try to take out an armored car that's got the German payroll in it. And it, the whole event falls apart. Um, I won't go into the details of how, but Pelloui gets shot. He's very, very badly injured. And um, 
they take him to the chateau where, guess what? Henriette can take care of him. She'd always wanted to take care of him. And uh, for all the years they were together, she was never able really to tell him anything. So he's in the chateau and he's beginning to recover a little bit. Henriette signaled to Père Louis that she would like to talk with him privately. Once, excuse me, unable to say what was really troubling her, Henriette sat stiffly on the edge of her chair, her stomach churning around as she scrutinized the profile of Père Louis' face, afraid to admit to herself that she'd imagined this moment so often. They had never before had any intimate time together, and she had played it over and over in her mind as to what it would be like. Now it was here, she was unable to enjoy it. Here she was with her friend, the abbot, a maquis, a person she respected, trusted, and admired, but he was also the one man she deeply loved, and loved, had loved for the past 13 years, something she could never admit to him. She dreamed this scene so many times with her sitting on his lap, hugging him, being gently caressed by him as he held her in his arms. She knew deep down that this was the only man that could make her supremely happy. Feeling the warmth of his body, the tenderness of his embrace, the beating of his heart as she rested his head on his chest and experiencing his complete love for her, tears of utter happiness ran down her cheeks. The silence was broken by Père Louis as he turned towards her and she immediately took out her handkerchief discreetly dabbing the corner of her eyes, trusting that her eye makeup had not run. Speaking softly, he said, Henriette, I think that both of us know what you wish to say, and it's truly beautiful. We both know what it means to love somebody totally, someone who is a soulmate, and that is God-given. But we are both bound each in our own way by the commitments we have made, you to your religion and me to my vows, and about which we feel so strongly Nothing will come between them. I know that you care about me and truly love me as I do you. But we both also have to live with the pain of knowing the expression of our love will be restricted. Oh, Pear, she responded, her voice breaking with emotion. I feel so guilty. Please forgive me. I had no idea I, it was so obvious that you could read my heart so well. Henriette, there's no need for forgiveness. I think I know what you would like to say. True love is a beautiful thing, and I've known about you for many years, so let us rejoice and thank God for the gift of each other. And now I really must go. And with that, he stood up and walked towards the door. As Henriette unlocked it, he turned to her and briefly kissed her lightly on both cheeks, and with a simple bonsoir, strode off into the night. She stood there watching until the darkness enveloped him, with his words still ringing in her ears. There was nothing to assuage her pain, her sense of loss, not even prayer, nothing to fill the gaping hole she felt inside herself. Locking the shadow door seemed to accentuate her feelings of loneliness and separation. Her footsteps rang hollow as she climbed the stairs to her room, and as she lay down, she was overcome by the vivid memories of the sounds of his voice, his gentle touch, and his chaste kiss. She knew it would be a very long night, even as she cried herself to sleep. D-Day had taken place the 6th of June, and in the south of France, the crack regiment, the Das Reich 2nd Regiment, they were the crack, crack troops for Hitler. They were taking some R&R. &R. They were given immediate notice to hot foot it to Normandy, and they had 15,000 men here and over 300 tanks and about 400 heavy guns that they needed, and they needed a what? They needed a train. Unfortunately for them... The Maquis destroyed every single flatbed carrier. And so what should have taken 72 hours to get to Normandy, it took them 21 days because they had to take the tanks on the roads and, ro and tanks do not do well on roads. They kept breaking down. And as this map shows, all those little red things are where the Maquis fought them all the way to Normandy. On the hit and run, they kept hitting them and running away, hitting them and running away. And so when they got to Normandy, 
they ran into the bus saw of the Falaise Gap and the American forces who just landed and they were torn apart. Um, the, this guy is really interesting. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Bomber and he was in charge of the garrison in Brive la Gaillard. And uh, this is not City Hall. It's a, a, a big hall that was occupied by the Germans as their headquarters. And uh, they were surrounded. He was surrounded by uh, the Maquis. And so the Maquis put together a nice big white flag and got through to his office. And he thought they were coming in to surrender. And they said, no, we've brought the white flag for you. <laughs> and he was th taken back. They said, look, we've got you surrounded. We've got brief surrounded completely. You're done. You may as well surrender. And he bought it and said, OK, I will surrender. But I can't surrender to you guys because you're not military. You're Maki. I can only surrender to an officer. So they, they ran around. And they brought in um, Henriette, by the way, as a translator, because she spoke German. So they ran around, and um, they found these three guys. One was an, two were Americans, and one was British, actually French. And the French guy, they called, Colonel, they called him Captain Jack. He was no more a captain than my left foot. But they, <laughs> but they called him Captain Jack. So they went back to Bomber and said, look, we found a captain who's in uniform. Um, uh, will you surrender to him? And he said, yeah, I'll do that. And so he actually surrendered to, Colonel, to Captain Jack. And brive le gaillard became the very first town or city in France to self-surrender. Paris came two weeks later. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to feel them. Yes? Are all those people you talked about real people? I know you're writing historical fiction, but you have pictures of people. So I'm a little confused. Some are real and some are not. I'm going to go back and tell you which ones are real. No, no, no. <laughs> I, get asked that que I get asked that question all the time. And of course, in historical fiction, you're writing like Bowman, the Lieutenant General. He's real. He was a real guy. And uh, Bubbleberg is a real guy. Um, Henriette is not. She's a composite picture of two women I knew in France. What about the twin? No. Oh. <laughs> Out of here. You have a picture of two women who are twins. Yeah, that, those, let's call it, that was just to illustrate who they are. <laughs> Janet. The SOD people that died, did they die because they were captured or did they die in battle? Which ones? The men and the women and the SOE. And the SOE? No, they were, they were captured. They were all captured. All of them you see there, they were captured and tortured by the Gestapo. And they either died on the spot or they died in the camps. Yeah, they didn't mess around. Once they were identified as Maquis, there was, there was no treatment, unless if they were involved at all in messing around with a German officer, they executed him. And it was almost like 20 to 1. It was, the, the brutality of random executions was horrible. This, it's all been documented. It's pretty bad. Yes? I'm curious about the uh, exile in France, how many French were in England, and how many of the English SOE, in other words, what's the division of Resistance in England. Well, in order to, in order to be part of the SOE uh, on the French division, you had to be able to speak fluent French. So it meant either you were French yourself, or you had a parent who was French, or you'd had been educated in France. And Sid was one of those. He was English with two English parents, but he'd lived for four years in France before the war, actually in Grenoble at the university. That was where he learned to speak French. So that was one of the number one item was, do you speak French? And in fact, it is, it's very funny. He goes for an interview. And uh, he, he, it was, there was an advert in the newspaper. If you want a job with the British government, call this number. And so he called the number. And he said, OK, get the next tra train down to London and just show up at this house, So which he does. 
And uh, of course, he said the headquarters, it's never listed anywhere in any yellow pages or anything, just the number. So he goes into the house, and there's uh, Vera is there, the woman who recruits. And the first thing she does is talk to him in French. The whole conversation was in French. And he is absolutely blown away because now he's having to scramble, you know, thinking of all the, the words he could remember. And then after 10 minutes or so, it came back to him and he, he spoke fluently. But yeah, that was the number one thing you had to, had to be able to speak French. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess my first question then, Sid is real? Sid is not real. Yes. Yes. The question is, if you, if you heard it, did I do research into the real, into the Mackie themselves? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Annie just Annie came in. Annie came into my library. Was it this morning or yesterday? And you said, "Oh my God!" And she said, "Look at all those books on the resistance." <laughs> But yes, and we were very fortunate actually. Some years ago, we were in France together and we went to the Vercors, onto the plateau. And we met one of the very, very last Mackie still alive. And he was operating a private museum there uh, of artifacts from uh, the battle. And his name was Pier, Pier, an Italian name, Pier Santini was his name. And he produced a book called uh, Les Memoirs, The Memories of Vercors. And he spoke to Annie and myself, and he signed the book for me. He's dead now. So yeah, they were alive. And, and I was very fortunate in doing my research. Um, because I speak French, I was able to get into French archives. And um, I'm still today, in fact, I'm pulling up different articles. The, the one thing I'm really, really interested in is the whole question of the, 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 the railway system. You know, I didn't touch on it tonight, because it's a real hot potato. But um, all those trains with Jews and Mackey, who was driving them? Frenchmen. It's the whole question of collaboration and the, and, and the Chemino. It's a very touchy, and it's, it's, the polemic is a lot on it. Uh, it needs another book, and I'm still researching that kind of stuff. I found a couple of articles just last week. But yeah, that's a tough one. What did, the, the, Jews could we could, the Jews could never have left France without the railways. And the Germans weren't running the railways, it was the French. <coughs> Any other questions? Wasn't the French Revolution beginning of romanticism too, as far as writing and music? Can I hear you? I, 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 did, I didn't hear your question. I said, isn't the French Revolution the beginning of romanticism with writing, literature, and music also? Oh boy, you're asking the wrong person. I can't answer that question. Yes? Uh, how, do you, how do you measure whether the Mackies were successful or not? That's a great question. Go talk to Eisenhower. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's, that question pops up all the time. You know, just how effective were um, the Mackie? You know, in many ways, you could look at it from one side and said, you know, they were amateurs playing soldiers. They got themselves killed. You know, um, they tore up the tracks and blew a couple of tunnels on the trains. But what happened? Two weeks later, the Germans had repaired them anyway. You know, all, so there's, there's back and forth about that. But right before D-Day, what they did, and the way they held the Germans and identified strategic points for, so the RAF could bomb the damn places, um, Eisenhower was really clear. And he said, without the French Mackie, we would never have won the war in France. He was really clear. It was a great question, Alan, it pops up all the time. When you think about it, at the end of the day, there were very, very brave men and women. That's the bottom line. Uh, in, in the uh, No Room for Heroes, one of the things I've done, and I didn't do it in my other book, I, I put in these little snippets of history of where you have a character, a real character. Where are we? A real character. Uh, maybe, can I pull one up for a second? If I can find one, just for... I put in um, just a few words um, to say who they are. Um, here you go. So, Monique goes down to the south of France dressed as a nun uh, with these wounded 
Ammon. And she turns them over to this chic old lady who's in her 80s, French woman, who organizes the whole damn thing to get them across the, the Pyrenees into, into, into Spain. And she's done it, she did it. Amazing woman. And she sits there with a 10-inch cigarette holder and four cats, you know, and, and Monique's kind of saying, where the hell does she get the food from to feed her cats, never mind anything else? And she's living in this kind of attic and it's directly opposite the Gestapo offices in Toulouse, literally. And she said, well, they're opposite me. They'll never think of coming here. So, but who was she? She managed to get and supervise 240 airmen across the border, this woman. And her name was Mary Desaad. You may, maybe never heard the name, but I put it in the book. She was honored by France with the Legion of Honor the Croix de Guerre, 1939 45, with palms, and the Medal of the Resistance with Rosette. From the UK, she received the George Medal, and from the USA, the Medal of Freedom. Just a little old lady. So I put snippets like that throughout the book where there are real people. Thank you. <laughs>